We're going to take up a consideration today, something that wasn't planned, but something that was thrust upon us by some recent news of the wicked behavior of a man who was considered by many to be the leading apologist of our time. It was undercovered that this individual had used his position to groom and take advantage of vulnerable women to meet his own gratification. He did this multiple times in multiple places, and when one woman leveled accusations against him, he used his position and his reputation to humiliate and silence her. One of the persons who worked in his organization and considered this man to be his mentor has written and said the realization that his mentor was, quote, not the greatest apologist of his generation, but rather one of its greatest frauds, has felt like a catastrophic betrayal. I sat under this man's teaching myself on multiple times. I read several of his books. I wrote my own book and sent it to him and asked him to review it. And when I was writing the book, I quoted him as much, if not more, than any other source within it. Uh, It was a sense of uh, thrill when he responded and offered up an endorsement for the book. And so he was the most famous and well-known Christian leader to endorse the book. His name is on the front cover of the book. And we'll have to rewrite the book and we'll have to republish it because of what's taken place. My purpose today is not to address this failure straight on. I don't really, at the moment, and we can look at that on another occasion possibly, or we can speak together about this privately. Instead, what I want to do is I want to consider the reactions that have been put out in blogs and newsletters and video posts in response to the fall of this man and this man that was considered to be a worldwide Christian leader, and there's no shortage of it. If you just want to Google this man's name, and I think you know who I'm referring to because I sent an email out to you just the other day telling you who we're going to be speaking of, uh, and the reactions to this fall, you'll be able to go pages and pages deep in a search engine finding the various responses, and I've spent quite a bit of time over the last while reading the different responses and listening to different responses, and, and many of them go for uh, over an hour Yet I just wanted to hear what different people were saying about it. What I want to do is I want to discuss the different responses that people are giving. And I believe that many of the responses or the primary responses that are being given may prove to be counterproductive in gaining hope for Christians in the face of these types of things. Counterproductive for us seizing also the opportunity that God gives us to live as lights before a dark world. Also, I think the responses can sometimes perpetuate the underlying reasons for why these types of things happen. And so what I want to do is I want you to allow me to share with you what I see as and what, and I didn't want to presume upon this. So again, I read all these responses and listened to these responses and out of it, it seems that I can, I can call out what seem to be the three most common responses and I want to share them with you. And I, I want to then explain to you what I think are the dangers in these responses, although I don't want to forsake or ignore the fact that there is true and good wisdom in all these different responses. And I I want to note those things, but underlying it, I want to share with you what I think are their inherent weaknesses. And, And then what I hope to do as we go through each one of these points is I hope to show you a higher, more promising affirmation that we can make and a more promising way that we can respond that actually brings us to take hold of a hope and an opportunity in the face of these types of sad accounts. Here are the top three responses to the story that seem to be being made. And the first response is this. It's a call to let this event remind us that we ourselves are all sinners. It's the most common thing. In fact, uh, more than 50% of the time and looking and reading and listening, uh, a phrase was made that I heard over and over again, but for the grace of God, there go I. Just remember that we all tread upon this sinful world and that we are all sinners. Let this remind you. Let this horrible, awful event remind you that we're all sinners. That's the first response. Here's the second response. The second response is that we're being told that this event should teach us to take our eyes off of people and man and to set our eyes on Christ alone. That our eyes are to be fixed on Him and not on any other individual Because they'll always disappoint us and they'll always fail. Here's the third response. In light of those two, the first one that we see that we're all completely sinners, that we shouldn't have our eyes upon men but on Christ only, the third response is to then offer up extensive consideration of the practical ways that we can avoid falling into sin. Extensive, practical, pragmatic designs 
how that we can navigate this world and not fall into sin. And, and then based upon that, basically, and this is the heart of most of the different messages that I've read, are unleashed uh, any number of speculations on how this person's failure came about. It came about through the stress of living in the limelight for through a burnout because of the work he was doing, or from boredom because they were such strong, powerful type A persons, or their lack of accountability before others, or not taking the proper measures to guard themselves against temptation, like traveling without their spouse. And there's a number of things that are given for us along these lines. And then obviously, as a result, we are then given instructions on how to make sure that this doesn't happen in our own life so that we can navigate through this world and not fall into and avoid these kinds of sins. So there are your basic three responses. Basically, remember that we're all sinners as we look at this thing. Don't put your eyes upon men, but put your eyes upon Christ. Here are the practical things that you need to remember and put into effect in your life so that you can avoid falling into moral compromise. Those are the three primary responses. And I want to share with you my concerns regarding each of these. And I hope to show you what I believe is a more hopeful, victorious way to respond to these things. And yet at the same time, I want to acknowledge the truth in what's being said here as well, that there's something true and good in these things. And I also want to say that Many of these individuals are people who are deeply impacted by this individual. And so I don't know that, and this is true of myself as well, our first responses are always the best responses because we're rocked back on our heels because of these types of things. But having thought of that, let's look at them one at a time. First, this idea that we should let this horrible revelation of the terrible compromised private life of a very public Christian remind us of our own deep sinfulness. I simply say this, that I'm concerned that this response has uh, the unintended effect of making it seem that sin is inevitable in our lives. And at the same time, it seems to be revealing a deep insensitivity to sin. Uh, My concern is that the effect of this kind of approach, when we come before these atrocities to say, this should teach us that we're all sinners, is actually to make us Uh, think that somehow it's inevitable that it'll catch up with us as well and also it reveals somehow in my mind at least an insensitivity to the sin and to sin as well in our own lives but first I want to acknowledge that this kind of awful behavior will make those who associate or hold identity with the person who committed the sin feel the defilement of that sin Anyone who is close to this individual, anyone who drew upon the resources that seem to be pouring out of their life and were benefited by it, will feel something of the defilement of that sin once it's made known to them. And so I just, I want to say this to you, to keep this in mind. I want this, this is a proper reminder for all of ourselves. No one sins to themselves. There is no sin that does not have its victims Your sin leeches into the environment that you live in and poisons the well of fellowship from which all around you drink. This is all the more true for leaders and teachers, and that's why God's Word says they'll be more strictly judged. But it is true for all of us. Our sins defile those around us. And when they become known... Those who are sensitive to sin feel its taint upon their own consciences. and We can see this and understand it. At the same time, also, we must acknowledge that when there is a famous act of sin, sin's reality becomes hard to ignore in our lives. You know, people sin and compromise every day, and yet we can go through a day and hardly even take note. We do it. And then we go to bed at night and think, now, let me think. What do I need to confess from this day? I can't hardly think of anything I did wrong. And When something happens to this extent, it's hard for us to ignore the reality and presence of sin. And There are those, by the way, that think that Christians make too big a deal about sin. But I would only say this, that it's, it's impossible to make a bigger deal about grace if you don't make a big deal about sin. The less I make about sin, the less you make about the grace of God. Romans 5.20 says that where sin abounded, there did grace much more abound. And so it's right in part. 
and unavoidable for anyone sensitive to this situation not to be made conscious that sin is the issue before us. And as we do, we provide an opportunity for grace to become even greater to us and more important to us and to seek that out. In fact, as we come before these issues of sin, it's most important to note that overcoming sin is only possible when we confess our sins and when we surrender our lives to the grace of God and the outpoured saving life of Jesus Christ. It's right when the failures around us awaken us to see our deep need to press into the open wounds of our Savior Jesus Christ. It's right. The one who suffered our punishment and pours his life out to us in forgiveness. It's also right in the face of evil that we should want to be, that our reaction should be that we should want to be washed from every residue of sin in our own lives and to live by the grace of Christ outpouring himself upon us because apart from that, folks, there is no victory over sin. There is no victory over sin. So those are proper responses. And I want to acknowledge that in these assessments, those responses can be found in their good, in this first reaction that let this remind us that we're all sinners. But now let me share with you what I think the danger is in this application, in this response that uh, let this remind us again that we are all sinners. And, and let me, I see in this at least two cautions. And the first caution is this. I'm afraid that this immediate pivot to emphasize the universal sinfulness of all of us at this point uh, will underscore to many, the takeaway that many will take away is simply that sin is inevitable, that it's just what happens in the world we live in and it's all around us. And this in turn will lead to a minimizing of sin and this in turn will lead to an insensitivity to sin and this in turn will lead to greater compromises in sin. The process goes something like this. He did it but we all do it after all. Some bigger, some smaller, but we all sin. And if you're alive, you're sinning in some way because none of us are perfect. And if I just think about that for a moment and I contemplate that for a moment, this, at this point, the doctrine of depravity can sound like we're all trying to cover our tracks with everything that's going on in the world. I have traveled all over the world. I've asked a question of individuals thousands of times, and I don't think that's an exaggeration to say that, do you consider yourself to be a sinner? And what I've discovered is 99% of the people that you ask that question, it's far more than 99% of the people, will say, yes, of course, I consider myself a sinner. And I'll ask them, how do you know that you're a sinner? And their answer will be an appeal to the theology of depravity. What I've discovered is everyone in the world holds to the T and in the Calvinistic doctrine of total depravity. They'll say, well, we're all sinners. Everyone has sinned. And by the way, when they say this and when they confess their sins, you also find out that they don't say it with a tear in their eye, with a tremor in their voice. Almost universally, they say it with a smile on their face. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, we're all sinners. The vast majority of the human race tenaciously holds to the doctrine of the depravity of man. It's their only salvation. Nobody's perfect. Along these lines, I want you to remember that the Holy Spirit is not the only one who reminds us of our sins. Satan does as well. The Holy Spirit wants to drive us into confession and into his own holiness and cleansing. Satan wishes us to concede to sin's prevalence in our lives so that we get used to it. Keep in mind that it's possible to play off the unavoidable reality of sinning in your life as a kind of cosmic excuse for sinning. What can I do? It's deeply inbred in me. It's my nature. And this is why the immediate response to a great sin like this of saying, well, let's just remember that we're all sinners can have the negative impact of actually making us insensitive to our sins and lead us to conclude that sin is a great dark wave that is unavoidable in our lives. This goes on to another point and another concern. My second concern is this. I think that this idea, in this important moment, to think that the most important thing to teach in this moment is to remind ourselves of our own sinfulness in the face of this kind of gross, wicked evil that is astounding and stunning and I don't want to speak of it here, but if you want to, you can go and read about it. 
seems to express in my mind a lack of a proper sensitivity to sin. That we take some gross event and some wicked and and utter failure that has been hidden from public eye, that has been fraudulently being carried out for years, and then it's exposed, and we say, now now remember that we're all sinners. Seems to indicate to me that we have lost a sense of sensitivity to our sins. I say it this way. You should not need the moral collapse of another to help you realize your sinfulness. If you do, you prove that you've wandered far from the presence of a holy God and that you're only warming your heart and yourself by the little fires of your own religious making. There's something to my mind at least, and it might just be me, that seems quite ghastly about making such a connection. Might we as well go before the genocidal atrocities of Mao or Stalin or Pol Pot See how they wiped out human beings right and left to the millions and say, now here's the takeaway. Remember, we're all sinners. Might we go into the dens of dark alleys and streets of the world population and major cities where sick and devious men are barding away to purchase little children for their own pleasure and say, see that and remember, we're all sinners. If that's what it takes... If this is the point at which we're made aware of our sins, we have a problem. We've become far too insensitive to our sins. If this is what it takes to wake us up, then we have to wonder if God has already given us over to our sins altogether. And I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that the Holy Spirit is actively engaging each one of us always by God's mercy and grace to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. So what's a better response or a more hopeful response to this? I think it's better to say this before evil that has been exposed, even great evil. I don't think that we avert our eyes from it and we don't also somehow think that we're aloof from it. I don't think that's the right response. I think the better response is to say this. This is the course where all the little trickles of sin in your life are flowing. Every rivulet of compromise and sin in your life seeks the source of evil and wickedness that is illustrated in this place. And so, hate your sin and flee from it when it's small and when it's just raising its first desire in your heart. Run from it, don't tease it, don't play with it, don't give into it because the course it wants to flow is into this great reservoir of evil and some men not guarding themselves are swept away into it. Let's remember the song that Charles Wesley taught people to pray. I want to quote it to you. I want you to listen to the words very carefully. We've sung it in our church on a number of different occasions. It says this, I want a principle within of watchful, godly fear, a sensibility of sin, a pain to feel it near. I want the first approach to feel of pride and wrong desire to catch the wandering of my will and quench the kindling fire. From thee that I no more may stray, no more thy goodness grieve. Grant me filial awe, I pray, that tender conscience give. Quick as the apple of an eye, O God, my conscience make. Awake my soul when sin is nigh, and keep it still awake. Almighty God of truth and love, to me thy power impart. The mountain of my soul remove, the hardness of my heart. O oh, may the least omission pain my reawakened soul and drive me to that blood again which makes the wounded whole. The sensitivity to sin does not come to us by standing and gazing upon the defiling ground of another man's atrocities. Brothers and sisters, if you need to know your sins, go to Jesus. Stand in His holy presence. Meet God in the temple of true worship by the Spirit. Find your sins there in the light of His presence. Find in Christ's wounds and in His cross your own rebellion. In light of the cross and in light of His holiness, find all the subtleties of your pride and your tendencies to make much of yourself. And find also your indifference to His love and His grace for you. 
Let that be the thing that teaches you of your sins. And if you do this, sin's dark hold on your life will not be inevitable. Its hold will be broken in your brokenness. Not before a fallen man, but before the man that took the fall for your sins. And then you'll sing in celebration another one of Wesley's great hymns. You'll sing, Plenteous grace with thee is found. Grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound. Make and keep me pure within. I think that's more hopeful. I think that's trajectory and the right response. Here's a second thing I want us to consider here. The next response that's given is that we should take our eyes off of people and put them on Christ instead. And it sounds good, and I actually agree with that in, in essence, but I'm concerned that in stating it, we're in danger of avoiding and giving up the primary mission that God has given us, the primary life that God has called us to live, which is to be an example, or to be representatives of Jesus Christ. It's to call men to say, look at my life. It's been changed and transformed. See in me the beauty of my Savior and His saving work. It's not to say, oh, oh, don't don't look here. Don't look at me. Do what I say, not what I do. Do what I believe in, not how I live it out. I don't think God gives us permission to have that kind of attitude, to have that kind of focus. And I'm concerned. I recognize, though, what's going on here. There is a sense in which the critique is being made, which is powerful and important to recognize, that there has been kind of a celebrity mindset that has taken place in Christianity today, and we don't need Christian celebrities. The power of godly, spirit-anointed ideas does not drive the messages that we largely consume in this Christian era. Instead, we go for the messenger who has the largest church, who has garnered for himself the largest following, mega churches, mega authors, Mega personalities are in the four. There are any number of great Christian classics that have come down to us and are still blessing people today that would have never reached our hands if past generations of Christians chose what they read based upon who had developed the greatest amount of popularity. In fact, the greatest works of Christian devotion have largely been written by those who had little or no appeal to the age in which they lived in. So it's good to be warned against hero worship and celebrity Christianity. And it's good that we be called to turn our eyes upon the Lord Jesus and listen to His voice above everything else. But once you underscore that, you have to remember this. If you make a calculation where, in a sense, you begin to underscore or to overemphasize the inevitability of sin, the next step will be to say something like this. Look to Jesus and not at me. Sin's inevitable, it happens to me, so put your eyes somewhere else. This attitude will relieve you of a responsibility that God has given to all of His redeemed people. There's no shortage of verses on this. There's no shortage of being able to illustrate this to us over and over and over again. In Philippians 3, Paul tells us that his whole life focus was to fix his eyes on the Lord Jesus. His whole life focus was to know Christ and to seek in pursuing Christ to be conformed into his likeness, into his image. And then after Paul says that, in Philippians 3.17, Paul says this, Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk, so you have from us a pattern to follow. Look at us who have the same mentality and idea. We just want to look at Jesus. We just want to know Jesus. And we want our lives to be completely expressive of following and being molded into his likeness. Follow my example and follow the example of all others who are laying down this pattern for your life. To Timothy, Paul commands him in 1 Timothy 4.12, Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. That's God's word to us as well. And all these things. Paul says of every believer in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we're ambassadors of Christ and of God. We represent Him. That's what he's saying. Paul also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that we are letters written by God, written and known of all men, and meant to be read by all people. There are other ways in which we've kind of said this truth. It's been, there are mantras or popular statements you may have heard before. I, I've heard it at least before. Maybe you haven't heard, but heard this notion. It seems to have been a popular notion 
and I think it's true, you are all of Jesus that some people will ever see or know to the church. You're all of the Lord Jesus that some people will ever see or know. It's true. As members of the body of Christ, as temples of the Holy Spirit, you're Christ. You are expressions of Christ's incarnation in the world today. There's another popular phrase that was made oftentimes, and unfortunately was oftentimes made to excuse people from being bold enough to verbalize their faith, and I think that's a mistake, but there was a truth in it. It was saying this, preach the gospel everywhere you go, and when necessary, use words. But at least the acknowledgement was, your life should be preaching the gospel. Your life should be expressing the truth that God saves us to the uttermost, that Jesus forgives us of sins, that Jesus' grace works in us in such a way that he not only saves us from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. That he transforms our lives. Preach the gospel everywhere you go, and when necessary, use words. And there's something true and right in those notions. And yet in this moment, it seems as which people are saying, ignore what you see here, (laughs) just move along. Look to Jesus instead and know the great tragedy of this sin is that it's blasphemed the name of our wonderful Savior. That's the great tragedy of it. And our response ought to be to seek God to make us encouraging examples of His own life poured into us and out of us to others, before others. God, Let my life be so absorbed and completely taken up with your life that I might be a blessing and a shining light of your truth before my brothers and sisters in Christ, before my neighbors and my friends. Oh God, though others might blaspheme you and lie and speak down their cuff when they speak these truths, oh God, empty me that I might be filled with you, that your life above everything else might shine from me. All right? I would not want to remove from any one of you the responsibility and the gracious, wonderful gift that God has given us where he empowers the life of every true son and daughter of faith so that we might be examples to one another and to the world. We're supposed to say to people, follow me as my life points to Christ and is expressive of his life. So, yes, look to the Lord Jesus. That's right. Yes, above everything else, look to men. Look to the Lord Jesus. In men, see through them to the Lord Jesus. But in looking to him, you should believe that he would make you an example to others. You can't retreat from your assignment. Instead, even in this moment, you must lean in all the harder in believing that the Lord Jesus can make himself shine through your heart when you truly and honestly surrender in fullness to him. And that, folks, is hopeful And that's our opportunity. And that's the promise God has made us. Let's look at the third response. The third response is to focus on practical strategies for maintaining a morally uncompromised life. And uh, I think that it's, you know, when we see people fail, we start to go, well, where did he go wrong? What did he do? What steps did he take? What missteps? What miscalculations? What compromises? What little compromises did he let in his life? What could he have done to avoid this thing? What can we do? What steps can we plot out and what are the practical ways that we can measure our life to make sure we take the right steps? And there are all kinds of practical advice that's given at this point. Practical advice for corporations that oversee and for ministries that oversee men in leadership. Practical advice for how a person ought to conduct themselves as they set up guardrails around themselves so they don't fall off one side or the other of the road. Things that need to happen psychologically so they don't become overburdened, overstressed. But here's my concern I think when our focus is to pivot primarily to practical strategies for maintaining a morally uncompromised life, we come dangerously close to a place where we put our faith on the same plane as every other religion and we miss the promise and power of our faith. When we just try to think about all the practical ways that we can avoid sin, we we relegate ourselves to being on the same plane as every other religion and we leave off the one thing that promises to make our faith stand out above everything else. I'm thankful for the wonderful practicality of God's word and how it teaches us ways to live a life away from sin. No one can argue that the word of God is wonderfully practical for navigating this evil age. And the further you get away from understanding God's word, the stupider you become in your patterns of behavior. Applying the basic principles of God's word 
work greatly. Principles like Paul's statement, flee every appearance of evil. There's a good rule for your life. Flee every appearance of evil. Or his other advice, which basically says not to entertain ourselves with crude and corrupting thoughts and behavior. Don't bring it into your life, even to amuse yourself. Or the commandment that's found in Psalm 1, where we should basically avoid the company of the corrupt and the scoffer. Or the direction or advice that James gives us, that we're to confess our faults to one another, that we might be healed. All of, that are, all of this is very good instruction. But here's the danger in merely focusing upon practical strategies for avoiding sin. We can communicate to ourselves and to others that the Christian life is nothing more than learning how to artfully navigate the moral potholes of this world. When we make our appeal to strategies alone, we put our faith on the same plane as every other religion because every religion has its strategies for navigating life and coming out of it as morally refined as possible. Every religion has strategies on how to somehow live the life making the least amount of compromises to the sins that come upon it, dealing with the pressure of their own natures, dealing with the forces of a world that tilts towards evil, and as we know, dealing with the influence of the God of this world, Satan, that seeks to bring them into ruin. And This is not a uniquely Christian expression or Christian point of faith. In fact, this is not, in essence, the Christian message or faith. If this is where we settle in our message, we've stopped short of true Christianity and are merely teaching ethics and behavioral adjustments. The Christian faith that begins and ends in the power and promise of an exchanged life. It begins in the regenerate nature that Jesus Christ brings to all those who trust and believe in Him. It begins in that moment in which the Holy Spirit is poured into our life and we become new creatures in Jesus Christ through our faith in Him. And We take the practicalities in mind, but we don't take them into our flesh. If you take all this practical advice and you say, now as this man living in the flesh, I'm going to incorporate these things, what you'll produce is a righteousness that God says is filthy rags. What you'll produce by all that labor and effort, although visually and before others might be a, 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 a vessel that's clean on the outside, is it'll be a whitewashed grave full of dead man's bones. What you'll do is you'll produce something that's just wood, hay, and stubble that God tells us will burn away before the holy presence of God. Your flesh will just produce more refined pl flesh, more careful flesh, flesh, more calculated flesh. But it'll just be flesh. It'll just be flesh. The Christian life is not a life lived in the flesh. And by the way, I can tell you that the word of God is wonderfully practical, but your flesh isn't practical at all. It constantly is moving towards folly. It's constantly moving towards destruction. And what you're going to need to glorify God and honor God is you're going to need a new life. <laughs> you're going to need God living and abiding in you. God sanctifying you as you surrendered fully and completely to Him. These types of experiences ought to lead us to say, Oh God, take over my life. Live through my life those things that bring glory and honor to you. The Christian is not to live in the flesh. We're to live by the power of a new life that promises to give us great victory and to give us a life that can be lived to God's glory so that we can say whatever we eat or we drink or whatever we do, we all, do all to the glory of God. That's, that's a promise of the Christian life. The answer God gives us for this overwhelming force of our own sinfulness and for Satan's temptations and for the world's allure is not more of our flesh. It's not more advice on simply how to gauge our life and how to make good choices and how to put ourselves in the best possible positions to avoid trouble. What God gives us is Himself. God gives us His life, His power, His presence, His renewal, His transformation. He promises to give us His own sanctifying power, His holiness to all who confess their sinfulness and surrender their lives in totality to Him. Think about it. Think of verses that they just begin to leap off in your mind if you'll study them. 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's an anomaly that stands out in the whole trend of the world. It says, if anyone is in Christ, old things have passed away. He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Everything has become new. It's a life abounding in the life of God. In partnership with Christ, yielded to the Holy Spirit, 
Paul promises, promises us in Romans 8, 12, that as we walk in the Spirit, as we walk with the Spirit, we get to put to death the impulses and deeds of the flesh. You're not a body with a spirit when you come to Christ. You're a new spirit, a changed man with a body. The body still has the appetite and raging, roiling influence of sin, but your spirit is in control because it's a new man. Your spirit has a new partnership or a new relationship. It's not an old man wedded to the evil one, Satan, but it's a new man wedded to Christ in the spirit. And the spirit resides with you and lives in you, and together the spirit has a plan and design. Let's kill the flesh. Let's defeat every impulse of sin. I'll show you where evil is appearing. I'll whisper in your voice when things are approaching that are unclean and right. And now you flee, and I'll put speed to your feet. That's the promise of God. As a result, Paul says boldly, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not gratify the lust of the flesh. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, Paul speaks out of this life that God gives us. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Our life does radiate Jesus everywhere we go. In Romans 8, 8 verse 37, Paul says this. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And when he refers to us as conquerors, he is speaking about conquering sin and temptation, folks. That's what he's talking about. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So give me practical strategies for avoiding sin. But then I must claim the spirit of Christ living within me to apply it with victory so that I might destroy its power through him in my life. That's the Christianity that God offers us. Now, what do you do when a person fails? When a person proclaims the Christian faith and they fail? You have to look at that and say something. You have to say, um, when, when they make all these claims and then it doesn't prove to be exemplified in their life and consistently and not continuously exemplified in their life, but actually continually something totally different that he was hiding. Well, when a person says that they believe that Jesus Christ is the one that washes us and cleanses us from our sin and Jesus is the one that comes and transforms us and brings us completely new life and Jesus works in us by his wonderful grace to lead us in triumph and victory over sin and then you find that that same individual was living in sin, they were not living in triumph, they were living in ongoing compromise, you have to say one of two things. Either what they believed was not true. God can't do that. He can't rescue you. He can't deliver you. He doesn't make you new. He doesn't transform you. He had, there is this, just a psychological trick and there is, there's just, just some positive affirmation that you're stating to yourself, but there's no real true power in enabling you to live over sin. You either have to conclude that or you have to conclude, oh, he didn't really believe it. He didn't really believe it. He professed it. He stated it. He plastered his life on the surface of it. But he wasn't yielded to it. He had a form of godliness, but he denied the power thereof. What's it going to be? We don't want to say that because it sounds ungracious. We'll leave ultimately to God, but that ought to be the fearful thing. Let me give you some conclusions here. Where does this leave us again when a Christian leader, a world-renowned Christian leader, is revealed to be living a fraudulent life? Number one, don't mistake full-headed intellectual delight in the wonders of the Christian faith for full-hearted Christian surrender to Christ. Number two, don't mistake the sentimental stirrings at the beauty of the gospel for the self-emptying, Christ-filling work of grace that God brings when he applies that gospel to any man or woman. You can get sentimental about it. Jesus, take me beyond that. Pour it into my heart. Number three, just because a person is intellectually and emotionally and willfully committed to arguing for and standing up for the truths of Christianity does not mean that they have surrendered at the foot of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
They may only be projecting themselves on the surface of these truths for their own sense of self-importance and aggrandizement, much like the Pharisees projected themselves upon the law of God for their own sense of self-worth. God, don't let my life just be a projection upon your truth. Project it into my heart of my being. Pour it into me. Transform me and change me. God, don't let me use my standing before others, adhering to these truths, delighting these truths, expressing these truths, be a way that I somehow position myself in a superior position to others so I can feel better and good about myself. God, that is the heart of legalism and self-righteousness. And it can masquerade itself as someone who confesses their sins and says Jesus is the gospel. God, don't let me just project myself on the surface of it. Oh, God, take me into its depths. Take me into the depths of your life. Transform me. Make sure none of these things are the case with you. The Lord Jesus must be everything and all in all. Christianity is Christ taking over all that is in me and me taking only him for my life. And when this happens, there's hope and opportunity in all of these situations to let God begin to broadcast from our lives in quiet ways. By the way, it won't gain the attention of most of the world. It's not flamboyant. It's not popular. You can't put it out on a billboard. You can't stamp your name on it. But when this happens, there's victory over sin and temptation. Consistent victory over sin and temptation. And when this happens, your life becomes an unforced example of the Lord Jesus to others. A quiet example of the Lord Jesus to others. And then life prevails to the glory of God and to God's joy and satisfaction. Then from even the grave, your life will bless those who follow you. So, just in, as a last thought, I want to encourage you to live with the end in view. Live today with the end in view. One day you're going to stand before the judge. You're going to stand before the Lord Jesus. And when you come before him, what are you going to want to lift up as your credentials? Your great intellectual thoughts, the words that you spoke, the people that you impacted by the, by the force of your arguments, the good deeds that you've done. I think you'll want to sing the song, this song instead. Jesus led me all the way. Led me step by step each day. I'll tell the saints and angels as I lay my burdens down. Jesus, you led me all the way. It was you. It was your life. That's the hope. That's the promise. That's the reality of Christianity. It's, Sometimes come to us through positive examples, but other times it's reinforced by these horrific failures. However way we come to it, let's come into Him. Let's totally yield to Him. Let's bow our heads.